Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here today to share my recent research work with you. I am a cognitive scientist who studies human behavior to learn more about how our brains are wired. I'm especially interested in how we use and perceive visual information. My recent work focuses on the question, how good are we at noticing what's happening around us? There's a lot at stake. For instance, how accurate of a witness would we be if a crime was committed right before our eyes? How aware would we be in a new and potentially dangerous environment? How able would we be to spot a security threat in a busy area? How good are we at keeping track of those kids? In short, it's important to understand what the limits may be to our visual awareness, our ability to pay attention to multiple actors in a dynamic scene. In fact, even if there is no action occurring, we often have trouble paying attention to all the visual information in a single scene. So I'm going to show you a blinking picture and ask you, do you notice anything out of the ordinary as this picture blinks on and off? So if you do notice something, keep it to yourself, make a mental note, OK? Here we go. Notice anything changing? Can I have a show of hands to see if anything changed? All right, let's watch it again. So somewhere between the retina of your eye and your mind's eye, the engine has fallen off this airplane. You see it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to show you another picture now. And this time, there will be what we call mud splashes blinking on and off. Try to see if there is anything changing in there. Who gets it? Raise your hands. Fantastic. All right, let's watch it again. Do you see the white road markings? That are changing. So when I was an undergraduate and I saw these demos, I was pretty blown away by it, that I could not see this in a simple image. OK, now how about a scene with action? I'm going to show you a busy Tokyo street scene. And there's going to be a lot going on. And what I'll ask you later is what your attention was drawn to. So different people will notice different things, and that's OK. So here we go. All right, so what can you recall? Can anybody tell me? Yeah, go ahead. When the second car stops, everybody sh just starts walking. Yeah, everybody was wearing black. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Fantastic. So he noticed the men dancing in a coordinated way. So let's, let's watch it again. So your attention was drawn by these men dancing in a coordinated way, and they were all dressed in white. But did you notice the person running across the intersection, or the bikes, or the woman in the red hat? Probably not, because this was just to demonstrate how difficult it is to spot out suspicious activity in a room that's full of activity. So researchers have tested these situations up close and personal. Watch this. Even when you're walking along the sidewalk, you're distracted by your cell phone and other passerbys, here a man stops a woman to ask for direction. Watch what happens. Right, if you look at the body language of the woman, she is completely not aware that she's talking to a different person who's now wearing shorts and a different colored hat. 
in case you missed that, let's watch that again a little closely. <laughs> now, people were not completely oblivious to that switch out. Researchers have found that people are aware of this switch out 50% of the time. Yeah, he's not having any of this. <laughs> so you could see that if you were a spy or a criminal, you can get away with some very shifty business by taking advantage of people's inattention. In the trade, one name this phenomenon goes by is called inattentional blindness. Now, why would humans have evolved with this kind of perceptual deficit? What gatekeeper in our brain causes us to notice some things in the environment, but not others? Well, let's look into the brain. The average adult brain weighs about three pounds, and that makes up about 2% of your body weight. And this relatively small organ is responsible for most of the activities in your body, and it forms a vital part of your nervous system. This is your primary visual cortex. It is that part of the brain that is solely responsible for vision. Now, you might find it surprising that the part of your brain that's responsible for your vision is in the back of your head. It makes up about 20% of your brain, by the way. Now, let me show you some other areas that are also involved in vision. Yeah, most of your brain is involved in vision. So 60% of your brain is involved in vision. That should indicate that vision is a very hard problem. Our brains have to be able to prioritize uh, its limited resources to the most relevant information in our environment. In fact, our brains have evolved to be junk filters or gatekeepers to allow us to focus on the most important information. In fact, evolution shaped our brains such that we prioritize paying attention to the things that are most likely to threaten us. Now, what might those be? Because we humans, we are both predator and prey. So predators have evolved to pay attention to distance, orientation, and depth. Their front-facing eyes are capable to quickly judge distance and depth. Prey, on the other hand, has evolved to be on the lookout. Eyes on each side of their head, scanning the environment for unusual movement, and especially approaching movement. We do both. Like rabbits, we prioritize paying attention to objects quickly approaching us. And like lions, we tend to pay attention to objects chasing other objects. But the key thing here is that, that our brains prioritize paying attention to animate creatures, or the movement of animate creatures in the environment, rather than inanimate objects, like your potted plant. So, if a ball is rolling towards you, it's most likely to capture your attention than if it is stationary or it's moving away from you. Similarly, if a person you don't know rapidly approaches you, you could quickly try to judge their intentions. He's looking pretty shifty. <laughs> Inferring intentions of animals and people are so important to our survival that our brains have evolved to even project intentions to inanimate objects. And this was discovered in a famous experiment in 1944 by Heider and Simmel, who asked this question, how would people remember the movement of a group of inanimate objects? So what we're gonna do right now, we're, we're gonna watch the actual cartoon or the animation from their experiment for a few seconds, okay? Here we go. All right, can anyone describe to me in a sentence or two what they just saw? Yes. Fantastic. So she just told a story of the big bullying triangle was attacking the little triangle. 
and the little circle looks scared. In fact, Heider and Simula found that when you show people these kind of animations, they automatically tell a story instead of giving a boring description, like you know, there was a box and three things moving about left and right. So perhaps this tendency to tell stories is a way of remembering all these movement of inanimate objects, and that helps us recall information. Could this ability help security people monitoring a crowded scene like this? How many objects and people can you weave into a story so you can recall the actions better? So in my research, we were interested in a realistic number of events and actors that you can recall from such situations, and whether generating stories about them will help. So how do you study a problem like this? Here is one approach. Suppose there has been a minor fender bender, and there are two witnesses to this who saw the entire event. The man later tells a story about what he saw. And the critical question here is, will the other witness agree with the man's version of the events? So her agreement or disagreement is very important. It tells us whether she saw the same actors and events happening. So in the lab, we cannot run traffic crash or traffic scenarios, so we have to go with much simpler stimuli to avoid confounding variables. So we followed Hydra and Simmel, and we generated simple cartoons like the one you're about to see here that consists of triangles, circles, and squares, each with unique color and a behavior. Some shapes chased other shapes. And then we showed one of these cartoons. We asked a subject to write a story about them. And then we showed the same cartoon to a different subject, and we asked them to read that story and rate whether they agree or disagree with it. So the critical variable here is the number of shapes, because we're interested in how many things you can remember. So we had cartoons that were ranging from three shapes to nine shapes. So let's watch one of the cartoons from our experiment, and I'll tell you a story that we collected as well. All the shapes started out playing together in the field. The circle then got bored and crept away to the other side of the room. The triangle missed the circle and quickly found it and started to hang out with it. The square played by himself, and then after a while got lonely, and then joined the other two. So remember, I'm directing your attention. I'm telling the story as you're watching the cartoon. In the lab, people saw the cartoon and then read a story. So they had to remember the events. Most subjects in our experiment agreed that the story matched the contents of the cartoon. But what about if there are more than three shapes? So now I'm going to show you a difficult condition from our experiment, a cartoon with nine shapes. And then I'll tell you the story afterwards. So watch this carefully. Okay, so here comes the story. An orange circle started following a purple circle just because of its similar shape and how pretty the purple looked. The purple circle didn't want to be followed, so it went to the other side of the room and got lost in the crowd. But the creepy orange circle kept following it. So if you're paying attention to the purple circle, the purple and orange circles, you're most likely to agree with this story somewhat. But what if you're paying attention to the blue square? Then it becomes more difficult. So only some subjects in our experiment agreed that, all right, the contents of the story matched the cartoon. So does the story really help recall what happened? Here's what we found. So we plotted the number of shapes against accuracy. So if you're guessing, completely guessing, your data would be on the dotted line. And if you're really good, then your accuracy would be around 100%. Here's what the data looks like when subjects saw a cartoon with three shapes. They're really good, 81%. Now look what happens when we add one more shape to these cartoons. Accuracy falls to 61%, and it stays low as we add more shapes. So these were cartoons just containing three to nine shapes, and accuracy quickly decreased after you show them a cartoon with more than three shapes. 
So we repeated several experiments and we found the same pattern of results. And the key thing here is that your accuracy decreases when you have more than three shapes and in a simple cartoon. So what does this all mean? One can imagine that this limit, whatever its cause, can have significant impact on the reliability of eyewitness testimony. Think about a witness in a court providing the jury with her descriptive story. It might be useful to remember that the value of that narrative or that story will decline rapidly if there are more than three actors involved. Our data suggests that these witnesses might be a little less reliable. We're certainly not arguing that eyewitness testimony is not useful. What we are arguing is our cognitive systems have limits, and it's important to understand what the limits may be to our visual awareness. Our ability to pay attention to multiple actors in a dynamic scene that allow us to create meaning out of our visual perceptions. So this work was in collaboration with all these fantastic people. I would like to point out Sehej and River, who are high school students working with me on this project. Then they went off to college at Stanford and MIT. And Jeremy Wolf is my mentor. Thank you very much for your attention and for joining me. And I'll hang around here, and you can come up here and ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you.